We're in Acts chapter number 28. Acts chapter 28 is where we're at. This is message number 57 in the book of Acts. Acts. Message number 57. Today, this morning, we are finishing the book of Acts. We are finishing it up. You know, it's been, um, you know, it's, I don't know, you might think I'm weird about this, but you know, I, I was I was kind of excited and kind of disappointed, <laughs> you know, going through this for the past over a year, over a year in the book of Acts, and so really I think, uh, I hope throughout the whole book that we can just see that through it all, God's faithful, and through, throughout every, every message, every passage, every obstacle that the gospel faced, our God is still faithful, and so we're going to read the verses 11 through the end of the book, and uh, if you're physically able, out of honor and respect for reading of God's word, let's all stand. <clears throat> Acts 28, verse 11. The Bible says, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came, and we came the next day to uh, Puteoli, where we found brethren, and, where we des- and, and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of, heard of us, they came to meet us as far as And the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when he came to Rome... The centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, and Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass, after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. Verse 19. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had aught to accuse of my nation of. For this cause, there, therefore, have I called for you, to see you, and to speak with you, because that for the people of Israel I am bound with this chain. Or excuse me, that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Verse 21. And, when, and they said unto him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that, ev- that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from the morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their, eyes, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and they should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Verse 29, And when he had said these, these words, the Jews departed and, great re- and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his hired house, And received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And the author, the human author Luke, finishes up the book of Acts. This morning's message is entitled, Preaching the Gospel to the End. Preaching the Gospel could say all the way to the end <laughs> preaching the gospel to the end let's pray and then you can be seated lord we thank you dear god for your word 
And Lord, I pray, dear God, that if there's any distraction, Lord, already, Father, if there's any, any thought, Lord, that of what awaits after the service, Lord, I pray that you would captivate that thought. Lord, I pray that you would just help us, Lord, to hone in and to focus on what your word has to say. Lord, thank, we're thankful, Lord, for the music. We're thankful, Lord, that we're able to sing praises to you. But Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would speak to us through your word. Father, just use me as your tool. Use me as your vessel. And Lord, that as your word goes out, Lord, that it would be profitable to the hearts and lives of your people. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. Maybe. <clears throat> No, I think it'd be safe to say that a word that could describe the Apostle Paul is that Paul was driven. He was a driven man. He, he, he was a motivated man. He, he was a man who was motivated. And, and, and understand this, he, he was not a man who was motivated by the flesh, okay? He, he wasn't motivated by the flesh. I mean, if we've seen what it's like when he was motivated by the flesh. Because he, when he was motivated by the flesh, he wasn't Paul the Apostle he was Saul of Tarsus. Now, now, is everybody awake? Is everybody here with me? Or, Brother Mike, or Brother Dave, is this thing on? Is this thing on? Okay. All right, all right come, come on, wake up now. I mean, when he was working in the flesh, he was Saul of Tarsus. And what Saul, what Saul of Tarsus, hey, hey, when you work in the flesh, it will only lead to destruction. And that's all what Saul of Tarsus was about. He was all about destruction. He was trying to destroy the church. He was trying to persecute Christians. He was trying to rip them from their homes and, and throw them into prisons and, and have them killed if they wouldn't renounce Christ. Sounds a whole lot like today, doesn't it? Sounds a whole lot like today. And, 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 and my wife told me this, that we should be praying, hey, just not for the people who are suffering there in Afghanistan, but we should be praying that the Taliban have a Damascus Road experience. Hey, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm guilty of not praying that type of prayer. Well, we should be praying that the, the Taliban have a Damascus Road experience. And it was on the Damascus Road where Saul of Tarsus, his life changed, where he wasn't no longer Saul of Tarsus, but God changed his life and he became Paul the Apostle. He was a driven man. He was driven to do this. He was driven to follow the will of God, to fulfill the will of God. That, that's what he was driven to do. That's what he was driven about. And as we're finishing up the book of Acts, we, we, this is what we'll see in the Apostle Paul. There was never any quit. He never quit. And, and, and we'll, we'll see that here shortly. You, you know, for, for sake of uh, context and for sake of background, I know that we have some people who were here with us this morning that weren't, weren't here the past several weeks as we talked about the Apostle Paul as we got up to this point. So just kind of bear with me as I give a little bit of background. The Apostle Paul, he had just been shipwrecked. He was going through a storm called Eurachlodon, and I've emphasized on how scary that name sounds, Eurachlodon, and he was on this ship with other prisoners. He wasn't there just as a passenger. No, he was there being escorted to Rome as a prisoner. And so as he was there on this, on this ship for, for two weeks, the Bible says he wasn't able to see the sun. Hey, when you're driving down the road and you can't see the road because the rain is so powerful and the winds are so strong, at least you can pull over. At least you can pull over on the side of the road. At least you can park under a bridge and wait for this storm to pass. You're out on the sea. You're at the mercy of the storm. I, 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 there's no stopping it. I mean, you are there, and you are terrified for your life. And so there's Paul and 275 other passengers, some being crewmen, others being uh, soldiers, escorting other prisoners. And so uh, they're there for two weeks, and they finally, they're shipwrecked on an island, and as they are abandoning the ship, they turn around and they see the back of the ship started to disintegrate by the power of the waves. I mean, Hollywood can't make up these types of stories. I mean, I'm telling you what. I mean, how terrifying that would be. You'd look away and then half the ship's gone. And all you see is just water caught in a pile on and pile on and pile on. And so they're, they're abandoning the ship and they, they're grabbing pieces of wood for those who couldn't swim as floating devices to try to get them to the shore. And when they're on the shore, they come across people that the Bible calls barbarians. Remember that from last week? Barbarians. Now, these barbarians, they weren't the type of people that had the bone necklaces and the bone through the nose and they're carrying mallets and they had tall hair and all that type of, type of stuff. But the reason why the Bible called them barbarians is because they couldn't speak the language. They couldn't speak the Greek language or the Latin language. 
So Paul, 275 other people, they all survived just like God said they would. They lost their ship, but for three months, they're on this island. An island called Malta, or Melita. <clears throat> so now this is where we pick up. You know, it was always Paul's goal to make it to Rome, to go to Rome. And so Luke, the author of the book of Acts, records their journey after the winter months that they spent on Malta. They were able to acquire another ship, thankfully. And their first stop was in Syracuse, where they abode for three days. And then look at verse number 13. It says, And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. Or Regium, excuse me. And after one day, uh, the south wind blew. And the next day, uh, and we came the next day to uh, Petoli. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. Forgive me if I'm wrong. But, but basically, when the Bible says that they fetched a compass, it, it means this, that they just really just kind of set sail and they just went. And they, they were just going. And they most likely would have sailed uh, south, uh, the, the eastern part of Sicily, and they found themselves in Regium, where, which is the southwest part of Italy, and they, they stayed for a day. And then they continued on to the next place, which was Petoli, uh, which was about 125 miles to Rome, okay? So I know a lot of weird names, and, 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 and I, I'm saying this because it's kind of important here. But when they had reached to Petoli, verse number 14, look what the Bible says there. We found other brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. So when they reached this destination, Petoli or Petolii or however you want to say it, 125 miles of Rome, there were other believers that got word that, hey, Paul's here. Paul's here. And so they, they came, and they, 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 these other brethren, they say, hey, Paul, you need to stick around for a while. You need to stick around for seven days. Hey, relax for seven days. Now, keep in mind, Paul's a prisoner at this point. There's a centurion soldier who is over him, and, and other soldiers. Now, for whatever reason, the Bible doesn't tell us why, but the Bible kind of leads us to believe that this centurion soldier allowed Paul to stay for seven days. Well, probably because this centurion soldier knew that if it wasn't for Paul, they'd all be dead in the ocean. <laughs> if it wasn't for Paul and his, and his guidance, then they would all would have perished on the sea of that, that day when they crash landed. So, the, the, so no doubt that Paul is in this centurion soldier's good graces and he allows him to stay for seven days. After a week, Paul had then began to make his way to Rome. Look at verse 15. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us from Apiforum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Okay, so as Paul, as he made his way into Rome, there were other believers who've heard. Believers from Apiforum and other believers from the three taverns. And three taverns is basically an inn where these believers were staying. Apiforum would have been about 52 miles. Hey, that's a pretty good walk. 52 miles from where Paul was located. And then you have Apiforum, which was about 33 miles. But still, I don't get the urge to get up and just walk 33 miles just to say hello to somebody. <laughs> you know what, I'm, know what I'm talking about? 33 miles, and then others from 52 miles. Hey, but this is the thing. Hey, I'm, I'm thankful that these, that these other believers, they heard that Paul was nearby, and they were sensitive enough to this Holy Spirit of God that they made their way to Paul, because this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that Paul thanked God and found courage, because these other believers, they came, they made their way. Hey, no doubt Paul needed encouraging. Hey, you get shipwrecked. No, 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 let's backtrack. You get arrested under false allegations. You're in Rome. You get transported in a ship where you said it's not a good idea to go in the first place. You're in a storm for two weeks. You don't see the sun. You don't see the stars. You think you're going to die. You shipwreck, and you're on an island with people who don't speak the same language as you, and then you finally get to somewhat of your destination. Don't you think you're going to need encouraging? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Paul thanked God and found courage. He needed encourage, no doubt. Verse number 16 speaks about Paul and the other prisoners. That once, the, once they arrived at Rome, they were turned over to the captain of the guard. Hey, now this has nothing to do with the passage here, but can you imagine that centurion soldier who was over Paul throughout that entire time? 
He was over Paul during the storm. He was over Paul during the shipwreck. He was over Paul when they were on the island for three months. They were o- he was over Paul that entire time. And now to see God working in Paul's life over and over and over and over again. And now this centurion, he's now turning him over to some other guard. I wonder what, they, what that centurion was thinking. There goes the man of God. Who knows? I'm pretty sure the Apostle Paul witnessed him more than one occasion. I'm pretty sure of that. So, as, so this centurion, he, he, turns the, he turns over these prisoners to the captain of the guard, and all the other prisoners, they go with one captain, except for the Apostle Paul. He stays with just one soldier. All the other prisoners are gone, except Paul. He just stays with one. Well, why, why does Paul get special treatment? Well, it could be for the fact that Paul was a Roman citizen, and, and, and that because he was a Roman citizen, he may have gotten some other special treatment uh, because of that. But as Paul, he finally made it to Rome, this is what he does. He ministers in Rome as a prisoner. He calls for the chief Jews to gather. He calls for the, 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 the Jews of Rome. He calls for the chiefs. He calls for the leader, and he calls them together. And look at verse 17 and 18. Look there. And it came to pass, after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when They were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because because there was no cause of death in me. So Paul, he's he's a prisoner still. He calls for the Jews of Rome. He's not in Jerusalem. He's not in Israel. He's in, he's in Italy. He's in Rome. And he's calling for the Jews of Rome to come together. And he says this, hey, hey, I, I, I want to let you know that I'm in Roman custody under false allegations. The Jews of Jerusalem, they, they, they transpired and they lied about me, saying that I was trying to go against our traditions. I'm trying to go against the law of Moses. But when it was, came to stand trial, they couldn't, they couldn't persecute me unto death because there was no evidence. There was nothing there that... And so look at verse 20, it says, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you, to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Well, what's that mean? Basically what Paul says is this. Hey, the reason why I'm in custody, the reason why I'm a prisoner, it's not because of, false, it's not because of the allegations that were made up against me, that I'm going against the law of Moses, going against the Jewish customs. That has nothing to do with it. I'm innocent in regards to that. The reason why I'm chained, back then they would have been chained to a soldier. The reason why I'm chained to a soldier, and maybe he's pointing to the shackle, is this, because I was sharing the hope of Israel. Now listen, the hope of Israel is not a what. The hope of Israel is a who. And he's saying the reason why I'm shackled here, and the reason why I'm calling you and wanting to speak with you is because I was sharing the hope of Israel. Look at verse 21. And they said unto him, We neither received letters of Judea concerning thee, neither of the brethren that came, uh, that came showed or spake any harm of thee. <laughs> These Jews of Rome, they, they said, Paul, we've never even heard of the trials that you went through. We never heard that you were shipwrecked. We never heard that you were falsely accused. We've never heard uh, uh, of... of uh, pretty much, they, I, I, I kind of le- I'm led to believe that they probably never even heard of Paul in the first place. We don't even know who you are. Well, verse 22 says, But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. The, the, these Jews of Rome, they said, We don't know a whole lot about you. We, we never received a letter from Judea about the, the, the things that you were going through. We've never heard any of the, about those things. But we want to hear what you have to say. What do you think? We don't know a whole lot about this Christianity thing, but we know it's spoken against a lot. So let me, let's hear what you have to say, Paul. And then verse 23, it goes on to say this. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. <laughs> so this is what happened. They said, Paul, we want to hear what you have to say. We're going to give you a whole day. We're going to designate a day where you get to explain to us this whole Christianity thing. 
And so what the Apostle Paul does, is the Bible tells us that, uh, that they came to him where he was lodging, and he expounded and testified of the kingdom of God. He explained and he was proving of the kingdom of God. Continue reading verse 23. Persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. So this is what Paul did. Okay, now, now let me have your attention. Now I know I kind of gave you a lot of facts and a lot of locations, and, and I hope I didn't lose you. I hope you're staying with me here. But, but, but now, now's the time to wake up, okay? So, so go. All right, wake up. Good. This is what Paul did. Paul, he took the Old Testament, because he's speaking to Jews here. The, the, the Jews, they, they would be familiar with the Old Testament somewhat. And he took the Old Testament, and he took the law. He took the law of Moses. And then he took the prophets as well, because they would have been familiar with that. And he brought them to the understanding that both the law of Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament, that they all both point to the person of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. He showed them through the Old Testament. Hey, church, don't say that the Old Testament's not important. It's very important. The Old Testament is just as much the Word of God as the New Testament. Give me an amen there. Come on now. I mean, it's vitally important. And Paul, he took the Old Testament of the law, and he took the Old Testament of the prophets, and he said, hey, look how these match up with the person of Jesus Christ. Now, no doubt how, how Jesus, know what he did? He fulfilled the law. And Jesus fulfilled the prophets. He fulfilled all those prophecies. Now, Paul, what he probably had done is that when he mentioned the life of Jesus, no doubt he spoke about the virgin birth, like the prophets spoke about the virgin birth. And no doubt he spoke about the place of birth, like the prophets spoke about the place of birth. And no doubt he spoke about his life and his teachings and his miracles and his rejection and his death and burial and resurrection. Hey, just like Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah happened long before the apostle Paul ever showed up on the scene. Okay, so, and that happened long before Jesus was ever born in a manger. And what Paul is doing is that he's saying this, hey, look at the Old Testament. Look what the prophets say. Look what Moses said. Hey, you know the person of Jesus Christ? He fulfills every single bit of it. And he's pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. He took the Old Testament and showed the Jews that the Old Testament points to the Messiah. You know, you would think, Paul takes, I mean, the Old Testament, did you know from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's a 400-year gap? 400 years of silence from God. From the Old Testament, from the end of Malachi to the beginning of Matthew. It's silent for 400 years. And Paul is telling these Jews of Rome, he's saying, hey, look what the Old Testament has said and let me show you who Jesus is. And it's, this, I mean, it's perfect. The, the, you cannot connect the dots any more clearly. That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the one that the law, uh, or the, that Jesus fulfills the law. Jesus is the one that the prophets had prophesied about. He is the Messiah. And you would think, you would think, I mean, the, these are Jewish folk here. They, they understand the Old Testament. They understand. They, it's like they grew up learning it, for crying out loud. They would think, wow, the dots are matching up. Everything's matching up. He was rejected just like the prophet said he was rejected. He was born in Bethlehem just like the prophet said he was born in Bethlehem. He would do these miracles like the prophet said he would do all these miracles. He's fulfilling all the law just like uh, that the law of Moses. He, the law of Moses cannot condemn him. I mean, he, he is matching up to the T that he is the Messiah. And you would think that they would all say, yes, he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. But look at verse 24. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Now wake up here. <clears throat> the Bible goes on to say in verse 25 that they agreed not amongst themselves. <laughs> those who did believe and those who didn't believe, the ones who didn't believe would say, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm taking liberty here, okay? So, so don't say I'm trying to change the word of God. Those who didn't believe would say, no, I don't really see it. And maybe those who did believe would say this, how can you not see it? 
How can you not see that he's the Messiah? Well, I'm just not, I'm not really too sure. I thought he was going to be a king. He's going to come and overthrow the Roman government. Uh, I just don't really understand. But those who did believe say, it's not about overthrowing a Roman government. It, 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 it's about freeing us from the bondage of our sin. Not political freedom, spiritual freedom. So this is what Paul does. Paul explains, for those who rejected him, for those who rejected the gospel, because that's what he gave them, for those who rejected the gospel, look at, look at here. Look at verse numbers 26 to 27. Look at your Bibles there. Paul, he quotes Isaiah, one of the prophets of the Old Testament. And he takes what Isaiah said and applies it to those Jews who don't believe. Okay? 26 and 27. Saying unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes are, uh, have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart what should be, and, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, now listen to this. When Paul quoted Isaiah, Paul understood that Isaiah was referring to a people whose hearts had waxed gross. What's that mean? It means their hearts are calloused. It means their hearts are hard. So when the truth of God came upon their hearts, their hearts were so hard that they wouldn't allow the word of God to penetrate their hearts. Does that make sense? Yeah. And Isaiah was saying that about a people whose hearts were hard. And Paul was taking what Isaiah said and applied it to those who rejected Jesus. So in essence, Paul was applying what he said and saying this, if you reject Jesus, you'll hear, but you'll never understand. Are you following me? When you reject Jesus, you'll, you'll see, but you will never ever truly perceive. You'll hear, but you won't understand if you continue to reject Christ. You, you, you'll see, but you'll never really truly perceive. And here's the thing, because this, because your hearts are wax gross. Your hearts are so hard. And because your hearts are so hard, it's like your eyes are shut and you really don't want to be healed from your sin in the first place. Yeah. Paul had made it clear to the Jews of Rome, the reason why you won't accept Jesus, now listen to this, the reason why you won't accept Jesus is this, because your hearts are hard. That's it. The truth is in front of you. The truth is clear. But, uh, but, and, and, as and as clear as the truth is, they're still not wanting to accept it. They're still not wanting to accept Christ. Now, Paul did not allow their rejection of Christ to stop him from sharing the gospel. Okay, and, and now hear this. This is important. Paul didn't allow their rejection, their unbelief, their disbelief, to stop him from sharing the gospel because notice how, ha notice how Paul handled their rejection of the gospel. Paul handled the rejection of the gospel from the Jews by taking the gospel to the Gentiles who would hear it. Verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles that, and that they will hear it. See, see, this is the thing. When some of the Jews heard it, some believed it, some didn't believe it. Some received it. Some rejected it. To those who received it, that's a glory, hallelujah, amen. But those who rejected it, this is what Paul said. The reason why you're not going to believe it is because your hearts are hard. And because your hearts are so hard, you're not going to be willing to hear it. And because you're not willing to hear it, the salvation message that's been presented to you is now going to go to the Gentiles. Hey, hey, this is what Paul did not do. Paul did not pick up his ball and go home and say this, well, if you don't believe me, then I'm not just going to share it ever again. Paul didn't do that. That wasn't the Apostle Paul. But, uh, but in fact, Paul did quite the opposite. Paul said this, if you're not going to hear it, then I'm going to go to people who will hear it. If you're not going to receive it, then I'm going to go to people who will receive it. Look at verse 31, or 30, excuse me. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him. Oh, his, his own hired house. Well, what's that mean? Well, basically, remember, Paul's a prisoner. Remember? He's on house arrest. He's basically on house arrest. And for two years, 
This is what Paul did. It didn't matter if you're a Jew. It didn't matter if you're a Gentile. If you came in and you wanted to hear the gospel message of Christ, then this is what Paul was going to do. Paul was going to give it. Paul was going, uh, Paul, was, uh, Paul was not going to be biased if whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're going to receive the gospel or not. No, Paul was going to give the gospel no matter what ethnicity they were. For two whole years. And now I like, I like verse 31. Verse 31 says, Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And that's the close of the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts closes with the Apostle Paul continuing, listen, continuing to preach Jesus to anybody who would listen. That's how it closes. And, and, and quite honestly, what a more fitting way. What a more appropriate way to close the book of Acts. To continue just to preach Christ to anybody who's willing to listen. It didn't matter if you were a Jew, it didn't matter if you were a Gentile. The only thing that Paul was concerned about, now listen, he's still in bonds. He's still a prisoner. He's on house arrest. It's not like he can come and go as he pleases. But the only thing that he was concerned about was this, that the gospel message would continue to keep going forward. That was it. That was his concern. And the book of Acts closes. He's in bonds. He can't go anywhere. But his concern was this. Is the gospel going to continue to move? Is the gospel going to continue to reach hearts? Is the gospel going to reach hearts to the Jews? Is the gospel going to reach hearts to the Gentiles? Is the gospel going to continue to keep moving forward? And then Luke, he puts the period, rolls up the scroll, and he says, that's the book of Acts. Now, you know, in a way, now, I'm not trying to be weird here. I mean, you might say, Brother Richard, you're, you're already weird. Okay. I'm not trying to be weird here, but in a sense, the book of Acts is still not complete yet. The book of Acts still isn't finished yet. Well, how, how, what do you mean, Brother Richard? Well, yeah, the, the human author, Luke, is he's dead, he's gone, he's in heaven. Well, so what do you mean that the book of Acts still isn't complete? Well, the reason why I say that is this, because the gospel is still moving forward. The gospel is still going. Paul has stopped and gone off to heaven. Luke has stopped and gone off to heaven. But the gospel message, church, is still progressing. And the gospel message is still moving forward, even after long gone is Paul, and even after long gone is Luke. And church, we as Calvary Baptist Church, we should do our part to ensure, hey, hey, this, even though Luke is gone, and Paul is gone, and the book of Acts is complete, no, 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 yeah, it's complete in a sense of, as to, in regards to what's preserved for us, but it's not complete in the sense this, hey, we still have a responsibility to ensure that the gospel continues to keep going. Continue to go. And if the gospel is going to keep going, then listen to this. We should not allow the rejection of the gospel to hinder our spreading of the gospel. You with me? Earth to Calvary Baptist Church, are you with me? We should not allow the rejection of the gospel to hinder us from continuing to spread the gospel, but rather we should continue to share the gospel with those who are just willing to hear it. To anybody who's just willing to hear it. Okay, even though we know that not everybody's going to receive the gospel. That's tragic. That is tragic. That there are people and they are dying. And they are dying without the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they die without the Lord Jesus Christ. They are destined for an eternal lake of fire. That God had not made for them. That God had made for the devil and his angels. But our God is so good that he made a way of escape from that. But we, we, we understand this. Not everybody is going to receive the gospel. Not everybody will. But, but I think, church, what we should do is I believe that we should have the same heart that the Apostle Paul had. Well, what do you mean? That Paul, he was willing to take the time to explain, to script, to explain the scriptures to people who have just never heard before. Hey, we need to have that heart. We need to have the heart of the Apostle Paul 
for people who, who say this, we've never, heard about, we've never heard about this Christianity thing before. We've never heard about the gospel before. Hey, I think it's important that we as a local New Testament church, that we would have the heart as the Apostle Paul that would say this, hey, if you've never heard before, let me take the time and just let me just show you through the word of God of who Jesus is. Let me show you who Jesus is. Don't, hey, don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Take God's word for it as to who Jesus is and, and, and take the time to, to do that. The Bible says from morning until evening. That's a long time. That's a long time to be sharing the Old Testament with them and going through the prophecies and going through the law and saying how Jesus is the Messiah and how Jesus is the Son of God. Hey, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people who just really don't know this book at all. There's a lot of people in the world today who just treat this book like it's a textbook, who treat this book like it's a book that just was passed down from generation to generation to generation. It's an American culture type thing. No, 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 it's a God thing, not an American thing. It's a God thing. And, and, and so there are a lot of people who, who, who maybe grow up and they don't know the scriptures. They might know a little bit like from Easter or they might know a little bit from about uh, Christmas or, or other events like that. But they really don't know the, the Lord of this book. And what they need is that they need believers. They need church members. Listen here. No, no, no. If you're a church member of Calvary Baptist Church, then you have a commission. You have a mission that is to do this, to share the gospel with people. And we need to have that heart that the Apostle Paul had to people who have never even heard that we would take the time just to show through the Scriptures, hey, let me show you who Jesus is. Not everybody's going to receive the Gospel. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've never sat down with a person from morning until evening presenting the Gospel to them. Never done it. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. From morning until evening. That's a long time. I'll tell you what, there will be people who receive it and there will be people who reject it. You know, when people reject the gospel, don't allow that to discourage you from ever sharing the gospel ever again. Will people reject it? Yes. Will people believe it? Yes. So keep going. Keep sharing the gospel with people. You, you, you know, uh, I don't think that we should only also have the, the heart of the Apostle Paul. I think we should also have the resiliency of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul did not say this. Well, because you didn't believe what I have to say, well, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home and I'm never sharing Jesus ever again with anybody. I'm never doing it again. Um, I'll never forget. Uh, I, I know I've said this before. This might be the second or third time you may, may have even heard it. I'll never forget where I was door knocking in New Mexico and I, I come across a, a friendly gentleman. He was sitting on his porch and, and the Holy Spirit of God said, well, he was just the next house in line. And so I just said, okay, I'm gonna give him a track and, and talk to him about the Lord and invite him to church. And then the Holy Spirit of God prodded me just to ask more questions about, hey, have you ever gone to church anywhere? And, and, and what's your church background? And, and those types of questions. And then we started getting to the real nitty gritty, uh, getting to the heart of the matter is this. And I asked him, well, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that heaven would be your home? He said, no, I don't know. And then and the Lord gave me an opportunity to say, hey, if it's all right with you, if you have the time, would it be okay with you if I showed you from the Word of God on how you can know for sure, church, you can know for sure that heaven's your home. That you can know for sure that heaven's going to be your home. You don't have to guess. You don't have to hope that heaven's going to be your home. No, God's Word tells us you can know. And I, and I asked him, is it all right if I take the time to show you on what God's Word says? Not just what some stranger you just met said. No, what, from what God's Word said. And we sat down. And for 40 minutes, going through the Word of God, and, I, and I'll tell you what, it was a good conversation. He wasn't argumentative. He wasn't debating. He wasn't saying, well, what about this? Or well, what about this? What about this? No, he let me speak, and then he would ask a question that was relevant, that I was able to answer. And so to, I got him to the point of understanding that he needed a Savior because of his sin. I got him to that point. And then I asked, him, and I asked him this question. I can't remember his name. Let's just say his name was Bill. And I said, hey, Bill, at this point, because of your sin, if you were to die right now, Bill, where would you go based on the authority of what God's word says? He says, well, based on what God's word says, because of my sin, I would go to hell. He says, does that concern you? He says, yes, it does. And I showed him the bad news, and then I got to show him the good news about who Jesus is. 
And I showed him that Jesus died for him. And I showed him that Jesus took his sin upon him. And I told him that the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Bill, it's not that you might be saved. You call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. The Bible tells us, his word tells us, our God's not a liar, that he will save you. And then I asked him, Bill, when do you think God wants you to call upon him for salvation? And he says, now? I said, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Bill, do you want to do that now? No. Oh. I'll tell you what. That is the most defeating feeling you could ever feel. I said, Bill, you understand. You told me. You admitted before, to me and before God that if you were to die right now, you're going to go to hell. And Jesus is offering you salvation, and you're not willing to take that right now? No, I don't want to do that right now. I'll tell you what. I did not feel like answering another or knocking on another door after that. I did not feel like knocking on another door. I mean, for 40, 45 minutes to an hour, I mean, we sat down and we talked. And we talked, and he understood and he hurt, and no doubt there was conviction there because he was telling me about the things that he was guilty of. No doubt there was, but he still said, no. I honestly, I can't remember his name. And I'll tell you what, I'm thankful that the Apostle Paul, just because some rejected, he didn't quit. He didn't quit. He says, if you're not going to listen... I, I, from morning until evening, I showed you from the scriptures, but if you're not going to listen, I'm just going to go to people who will listen. Hey, you know, you might share the gospel with somebody. You might share the gospel with a coworker. You might share the gospel with a family member. You might share the gospel with a relative. You might share the gospel with, with somebody who's close to you. And they, they just might say, no, I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with it. Hey, church, this is the thing. Don't take that personal. Okay. It's easy to take personal. It's kind of hard not to take personal when someone slams the door in your face and says you're crazy. Happened to me once. Little did she know, I said, I already know I'm crazy. So, no. But don't take it personal. You, you know what's just revealing? When they're saying no to the gospel, it's just revealing the hardness of their heart. Now, all the more, now wake up here. All the more reason to pray for them all the more reason that God would soften their hearts. And when God softens their hearts, it might not be you giving the gospel, but it might be somebody down the road who gives the gospel. And they might respond to the gospel and accept Jesus Christ then. But here's the thing, church. Hey, don't take it personal when people say, no, I want nothing to do with it. Don't take it personal because really it's not an offense against you. You're just really rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Don't quit. Don't quit. No, think of it this way. You heard the gospel, and if you received the gospel, you called upon Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now listen to this. Listen. listen. It's because somebody didn't quit. It's because somebody didn't quit. Uh, my dad's testimony is that he got saved at a football stadium on the 50-yard line. 50, right? 45. Oh, I can't. 45-yard line, man. On the home team? No, I, I don't know. 45-yard <laughs> line, my dad accepted Christ as a Savior. Praise God. Praise God for that. My dad grew up in a Catholic home. He didn't, he doesn't, after that moment, from, from my understanding, forgive me if I'm getting some details mixed up here, from my understanding, I mean, after that moment, he didn't, he didn't know where to go to church. He didn't know what church to go to. All he knew is that he accepted Christ as a Savior and that he knew that Jesus was a Savior. Glory to God, hallelujah, amen for that. Uh, but then, ew, you need a tissue, Charles? You okay? Okay, good deal. All right, very good. But anyways, how do you recover from that? I don't know. Anyways, my dad accepted Christ as his personal Savior and, and then um, didn't know where to go to church. He grew up Catholic. He, and, and then, and then from my, the best of my understanding, a Baptist preacher knocked on your door. A Baptist preacher knocked on his door. Talked to him a little, about, a little bit about it, and he said, wow, th this is kind of like, what I'm familiar with. This is kind of like what makes sense to me. I, yeah, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Praise God for that. Now, let me tell you, when you go door knocking, sometimes you'll meet some really friendly people and sometimes you won't. You'll meet some pretty angry people. You'll meet some people with a Cujo dog that they're really tempted to let go on you. Hey, but 
because of one Baptist preacher, I don't know. I won't know until I get to heaven. Maybe the door prior to knocking on his door, someone might have been rude to him. Someone might have said, no, you're crazy. Slam. Someone might have said, I want nothing to do with that nonsense. Slam. How it could have altered my life had that Baptist preacher said, well, if they rejected it, then I'm just going to assume everybody's going to reject it. So therefore, I'm not going to knock one more door. My, oh my, how his life would have been different. And my, oh my, how my life would have been different if my life would have ever existed. And how my wife's life, how it even would have affected her life and my children's lives. All because of this, because one man didn't quit. He went to one more door. He went to one more door. He went to one more door. He may have received a thousand no's, but he just probably knew there might be just one yes who was willing to listen. Calvary Baptist Church, we have a commission to keep moving forward with the gospel. We have a commission to keep moving forward. And, and it's my prayer, it's my prayer this, that we wouldn't stay stagnant, but we as a church would always keep moving forward. Hey, if we're going to move forward, now look up here, if we're going to move forward, we must move forward with the gospel and for the gospel. That's how we are going to keep moving forward. Hey, we can have bus routes and we have Sunday school classrooms, but if the gospel is not the premises, if the gospel is not the focus, then we're not moving at all. We're going backwards. We're going to move forward. Church, we must move forward with the gospel. Don't allow the people in your life who say no to stop you from sharing it. The Apostle Paul was shackled. He was on house arrest. If anybody had an excuse to not go on outreach, it would have been him. Am I right? <laughs> it would have been him. But even him, even the Apostle Paul, shackled to a Roman soldier, still did his part to make sure the gospel still needs to go. Are you willing to do your part to make sure that the gospel keeps moving forward? The gospel is not something that we keep to ourselves. The gospel, now listen to this. The, I'm all for lifestyle evangelism. You know what that means? That means people see that you're different. People see that you're a Christian and that they're curious about that. But that's not the way God wants Christianity to be shared. God wants us to proclaim the gospel. You know what that requires? That requires speaking. That's going to require boldness. That's going to require the Holy Spirit of God. Church, let's be proactive with the gospel. Paul was concerned. It doesn't matter where I am. I'm in a prison cell, but I'm concerned about the gospel moving forward. Hey, church, I understand you all have your own lives, but our concern should be this, that the gospel keeps moving forward. May the gospel move forward at Calvary Baptist Church because we're proactive with the gospel. We're moving forward with and for the gospel's sake. Let's be faithful of preaching the gospel all the way to the end. All the way. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. Lord, I understand, dear God, that, <clears throat> that there are some people here, dear Lord, who, Father, who are very familiar with the 